Welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining us today for our Real Estate and Architecture Photography webinar. And our special guest today is Steve Rutherford. Now, Steve is an award-winning commercial photographer with over 20 years of experience. He's based in the Gold Coast of Australia, so it's tomorrow morning for those of us in the U.S., and so thank him very much for getting up so early to present this to us. He travels around the world specializing in architectural, travel, and tourism, and marketing photography. And Steve is the publisher of One Shot Magazine. It's the Beginner's Guide to Photography book series. And he has been internationally awarded over 70 times in Australia, New Zealand, and the United States. Steve trains hundreds of photographers each year and is regarded as a master of photography in New Zealand. Steve, thank you so much for joining us. I'm very excited to hear what you have to say. So I'm going to hand it right over to you and tell us a little bit about your take on real estate and architecture photography. Awesome, thank you so much, Abba, and uh, thank you very much to the guys at Skyline. You're, uh, you guys have been fantastic in setting this up so that we can bring this information to those that, uh, that love this type of photography. So for those of you who are attending the webinar this morning or this afternoon, this evening, wherever you are, thank you very much. We're gonna go through a number of things when it comes to real estate and architecture photography. In particular, the business of real estate photography and then transitioning towards architecture photography, which is a whole different realm. So there's gonna be a number of slides that I'm gonna go through. I'm gonna have some visual examples and towards the end of my presentation, I think Abba, you're gonna take over and do a little bit of a demo within uh, Aurora HDR, which would be fantastic. And then we'll take some questions at the end. So let's get stuck into it, we'll get started. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about what the real estate industry is actually demanding from our photography. That's a really big question. Um, we're also gonna talk about what's needed to get started in real estate photography and the gear that you'll need. I'm gonna talk about how to engage with your agent or the realtor or even the customer, the owner of the property. We're gonna talk about why lighting is not the most important thing in real estate photography, which is quite often a large emphasis of real estate photography is around the lighting. And I can tell you it's one of the least important things. The next thing we're gonna talk about is ensuring image safety and preventing data loss. So many of us as photographers forget to do backups, to do all sorts of things to prevent this. So we're gonna talk about how not to have a bad day in photography. We're gonna talk about transitioning to commercial architecture photography. That is a whole new realm, a whole different way of doing things. So we're gonna talk about that. And we're gonna talk about why Aurora HDR is perfect for that type of infrastructure type photography. So let's go straight into it. What the industry demands. Now, the real estate photography industry, if you're already in it or you're new to the industry, has basically four key things that they look for. They want quality, high quality images every single time, both the agents and the owners. We know that. If you don't know that, then that's what they're looking for. They're looking for the highest possible quality images. They also want them at low cost. Now the budgets are often very low and sometimes, I'll be honest, unreasonable, but this is part of building your business and getting to know the agents themselves and getting them to know what you do. They also want the images delivered really, really fast. Now they have tight advertising deadlines quite often and they wanna get the, market, the property to market as fast as possible. So of course they're gonna require your images very fast. One thing that really stands out is that they always want you on demand. So you have to get used to being expected to be available on very short notice. So let me go into these a little bit more in detail. When it comes to quality and low cost, agents are gonna demand highly detailed and well lit images. What you need to do is you need to get a camera that can handle high ISO ranges because at times when you don't have the ability to utilize flash and a great example would be a very reflective room that has a lot of mirrors that is near impossible to use a flash because you'll see that flash in the reflections, be it a, a, you know, a, an atrium type room with a lot of windows, all those kind of aspects can make it difficult sometimes. So uh, a camera that can handle a high ISO range will allow you to fill the, uh, the frame with more light. 
And you want to aim for a camera that's going to give you anywhere between 100 and 6400 as a minimum ISO range. I also want you to get a lens that is wide, but not too wide. 18 to 70 mil is around about right, or even a prime lens, a prime lens that's fixed at say 18 or 21 mil. And just be mindful that a prime lens is going to cost you a number of dollars. Um, but we're going to go into that a little bit more in depth a little bit further on. Uh, low cost, when it comes to the agents themselves, they, like, we, like I said before, they have a budget for their marketing, but they often don't like to spend it. So all you should do is to research what others are charging. Now the cost can be anywhere between, or what you can charge can be anywhere between uh, $200 if you're on the lower end beginning in the industry to $500 in that sort of range there, all the way up to $2,000 to $5,000, depending on the type of property. Now that's not to say that you go somewhere in the middle and say, well, I'm just gonna charge it $2,000 to start with. It depends on how you build a relationship with the, with the clients. And we're gonna talk about that most importantly in this webinar a little bit a little bit later on. You've gotta remember that you are also a part salesman. Now you're probably recognizing that we're not seeing a lot of images on the screen at the moment because I want you to take note, we're talking about business. You, you're the agent, your agent is going to ask you to feature the most appealing part of the property. So you have to learn what those are and you have to use them, particularly in the foreground. It's really, really important that whatever you're photographing in the property is something that what not only the real estate agent wants to see, but also the owner of the property wants to uh, portray so that they can get the best sale price for the property. In saying that, I don't want you to go so far that you, you do all these free shoots for everybody because if, if you work for free, the agents are going to expect that. Always remember that if you work for free, somebody's going to expect you to work for free. So you're going to get a lot of phone calls from people who expect you to just show up and do work that's going to help out your portfolio. In, in inverted commas, going to help out your portfolio. That's going to do nothing for you starting a business because they're going to value your work at what level? Free. So always be mindful of that. So as an example, I want to talk about showcasing key features in the foreground. This photograph of a bathroom um, in, this, in this beautiful luxury property, and I apologize if it's a little bit pixelated on the screen, this is from a screen capture that I took from, from one of my files from a, a number of years ago. Um, you can see that the bathroom is well lit. It's late in the day, you can see the foliage outside, so you can see that uh, all the different features of what you would be experiencing whilst having a shower in this, this bathroom. But the main feature is the spa bath. I've avoided the mirror so I don't get any flash bounce back, um, but I've minimized all the other features. I'm not really interested in what the vanity looks like, I'm not really interested in what the shower looks like, even the bath mat, etc. I'm focused on the spa bath. And that's why I put that in the foreground. When we talk about getting fast, and doing, doing things really, really fast and being on demand, you need to get used to editing fast as well. An agent and a seller is gonna want your images as soon as possible to advertise them. Now, I want you to always remember when you speak to the agents, let them know early how fast you can deliver. Put it on your quote, put it in, in your in terms of service. If you're a two, five or seven day delivery type of guy or gal, then make sure they know that because if you say to them, I can deliver in two days and three days later, they're still contacting you to say, where are my images? You've done nothing to, uh, to help your relationship with that client or with that real estate agent. So be mindful of being upfront with them straight away to let them know how fast you can deliver. That way they'll know whether they can work with you based on the clients that they have and um, just what expectations they're gonna have every time they work with you. You also need to get used to working at evenings. Those of you that have already tried real estate photography realize that late in the evening, usually around sunset, is when the most appealing light is for focusing on a property. And it, it really takes a lot of time to get those kind of images right. So I would say practice when it comes to working in the evenings, but get used to being available on demand nearly every evening. And that includes weekends. I've worked with real estate agents that have given me 20 minutes notice 
to get to a property and it's a half hour drive away. So it, it can be quite demanding sometimes. So you need to get used to that. Here's an example of what I mean by beautiful lighting. So this is an Airbnb property that I photographed around about two years ago. And this was in, in the morning actually. And you can see I turned on the lamp in the corner to add some warmth to the room. The room is framed, so it's symmetrically near perfect. Um, but the morning light is glowing in through the window to the right. So I've positioned the frame so you can see where the light is coming from naturally and the shadows that it's creating across the coffee table and how it lights the room. This is important for a, a vendor, uh, sorry, not a vendor, for a, um, for a prospective buyer to come in and say, wow, this room really lights up. Now, if your images match when the real estate agent has a viewing, I said to this, this particular owner of this Airbnb property, I said, if you're gonna have a viewing for these kind of places, um, uh, in some regard, if you happen to sell it to a real estate agent down the track, I'd recommend having morning viewings if possible, because that's when the most appealing light in this property is. And so those kinds of things is what's going to set you apart. When you take that kind of time and that, that level of detail to speak to the client, to speak to the real estate agent and say to them, here's what I see. I'm not just here to set up my camera and take a photo for you. Here's what I see as the most appealing part of the property. And a particularly morning and afternoon light, um, photographed in the right way is gonna drastically help. Another thing that will also help is, you'll notice in this image, the big pink flamingo on the wall, absolutely fantastic. I love that print on the wall. But you'll notice that it doesn't really show you much of the property. What it's doing is it's using uh, an eye-catching image to coax the buyer into imagining that the property can be styled their way. Um, I use artwork on walls. I use vases. I use um, any type of ornaments or some type of home design decor to include in the main frame of many, many shots. And that will show the style of the property. And it, it also builds in the agent's eyes a way of being able to determine what type of buyer they may be able to attract to the property. So this goes back to my statement before, when you have to start thinking like an agent, if you're gonna become a real estate photographer and then leading into an architectural photographer, um, in a high-end type of industry, then it's best to utilize all the different features of the property to your advantage. And one of these kind of aspects is to utilize artwork on the walls. I've also turned on all the lights. You can notice in the bedroom in the background, the focus is more on the flamingo, which is eye-catching, but the bedroom on the left-hand side has all the lights on, which shows you a warm glow in the bedroom, which is often uh, quite inviting. Now, when it comes to getting started with the right type of gear, there's really only four areas, um, and I'll quickly gloss over these and we're gonna go into detail. Cameras, you should have at least a DSLR, not a point and shoot. You should also have a tripod available to you, even though you may not need to use it. You should not use a super wide lens. So those of you that, that are um, already doing real estate photography, you'll notice that if you use something like a 12 mil uh, wide angle, super wide angle lens, you're going to get distortion in the corners of your shots and it's going to um, create this illusion that the room is actually bigger than what it is, which can cause an issue of false advertising. I also want you to con consider not using fisheye lenses at all unless you're doing some type of VR 360 type photography. Um, there are other systems out there that will allow you to do those walkthrough type um, scenarios, but it's more of a, an advanced type of technique and probably for, a, for another webinar at some stage. Also, no filters. Don't use filters whatsoever. You won't need them. Um, you don't need polarizing filters indoors. Many of us will probably know that. Those of you that don't, polarizing filters really only for outdoors. Not even UV filters, which is use a standard lens on your camera. When it comes to lighting itself though, I want you to get trained on speed lights or flash heads and how to actually bounce the flash. I need you to learn to see where the lighting is actually needed. So if you're 
looking at a scenario or a scene and you notice that there is some some lighting that's needed in a back room or something that's not quite well lit enough, then you can utilize speed lights and flash heads multiply synced off the off one speed light to trigger multiple flashes throughout the property. And that will balance all the light in background rooms, down hallways, etc. When it comes to storage, I've only got three things that I say there. If you can get a camera that can use dual cards, you're going to win every time. Because if one of those cards needs to if one of those cards fails, then you've got a backup card already in the camera that is the images are being written to both those cards. If you can, if you can aim for those types of cameras, you're going to win. Dual storage. Whenever I do a backup, I back up to two hard drives at minimum. Um, when I say be diligent on the slide here, I mean actually check every file is intact. Make sure each one loads on the backup so that you can see and count how many files you have. There's been a couple of times where I've gone to back up my files, thought I'd moved everything off my cameras onto the backups and realized that there was a percentage of my files were still left on the card in the camera. And I'd gone to, it, gone to delete that card and clear it and format it and realize that, uh oh, I'm missing some images here. So that was a, that was a bad day in paradise for me at the time. <laughs> but um, it, It's a situ situation that will come up and guarantee that sometime during your photography career, you will lose files. You will have a corrupted card. So be very, very mindful of that. When it comes to editing, uh, processing software such as uh, Skylands Aurora HDR and even Luminar are built for this. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit later as well. Specifically on cameras, start with a simple DSLR. Like I mentioned before, a high ISO 6400 plus, have that available to you just in case. You won't need anything bigger than 16 megapixel. Uh, real estate agents don't tend to put images of properties for sale on large billboards, absolutely massive. And even if they did so, you can't get close enough to the billboard as they're hanging a freeway to see that the detail is not quite enough to, uh, to meet grade. So from a distance, it's not gonna make much of a difference anyway. So a 16 megapixel camera is gonna be enough. Make sure it's got some type of Wi-Fi wi or app control where you can take over the camera without having to touch it if it's sitting on a tripod. Um, and again, no fish eyes, don't use fish eyes at all. Tripods, um, I use three brands actually. Uh, Enduro for my high-end architectural stuff, Manfrotto and Benro are really good starter tripods that will get you up and running. Um, I believe Manfrotto, well, at least here in Australia, they, they're sold at Officeworks, which I believe, I think in the US is Office Max, the same, same brand. Um, they sell Manfrotto tripods there. Um, when it comes to the lighting itself, like I said, get a flash head that's actually gonna suit what you need it to do. It honestly needs to go with your camera's brand, of course, but also get a mini softbox to bounce the light evenly. If you don't know what a mini softbox is, softbox is just look up flash softbox, uh, Google that, and you'll see exactly what I mean. These are little mini, almost I like to think of them as little mini balloons, white or opaque balloons that will sit over the top of your flash and they'll evenly spread the light across the room. And if you're bouncing it off the ceiling, it's going to bounce wide and high. It's going to bounce off the ceiling and spread even further. So your lighting around the room is going to become very, very even. And then I want you to get used to using the lighting. Practice, practice, practice. I'm going to say that numerous times during this webinar, practice everywhere that you can. Storage, in particular, I've got a little recommendation here of getting a portable SD card backup drive. Western Digital make these things. I've used them several times. They work really, really well. We can, you can slide your SD card directly into the backup drive before you even leave the property. And it's doing a backup of all your, drive, all your, your images so that you know your first backup is underway. When we're talking about lenses, I want to go back to that for a second. You can see in this image, this is actually an image that I took of um, my own property uh, a long time ago. I used to own this property about seven years ago. And when I was photographing this property for sale, I mistakenly used a wrong type of lens. I thought it was going to work out really, really well. And I got this image back when I sat down in front of the computer and I looked at it and I said, oh, what have I done? So 
you can see that everything is exaggerated. It's a beautiful uh, part of the room, the dining leading into the kitchen, etc. The lighting is is well done, but everything's exaggerated. You'll notice the var the bottom of the vase in the bottom right corner is exaggerated and pulling to the bottom right corner. You notice even the wall on the left hand side is pulling towards the hallway. It's really exaggerated and stretched. And this is what a super wide angle lens will do. This was shot with a Sigma 12 to 24 mil lens at 12 mil. Very, very, very wrong lens. Um, it was also shot the wrong time of day. You can see out in the background on the right hand side that I've got really bright highlights out there and I can really only just see off into the distance. So it was shot at around about two o'clock in the afternoon. If I had waited an extra three hours, then uh, it would have been a much more uh, warmer shot. Um, and I also, for the purposes of this presentation, I, re I went in and re-edited this image and I've over exaggerated the saturation. So you can see what timber floors look like when they blend with a dining table of the same color. Be very, very careful of that because you're almost looking as though that table has blended straight into the floor and you've lost any type of foreground feature in that table and the vase to show you a setting as to where that dining area is seated in relation to the kitchen. So be very careful of that as well. You also notice the hallway on the left hand side, all the doors are open, no lights are on. It just looks terrible. So there's a better example of this, taken around about um, a day later. Um, that I'll show you in just a second. Editing software, we're going to talk about that. So I'll move on with that. Engaging with the agents and the owners. This is a very, very important part of this webinar and it goes directly to why we're doing this. And this is about building a business around real estate photography. There are four things that I want you to focus on. First of all, research, look up property photography, and what you think you could do differently. Then I want you to practice in your own home, practice in friends' properties, neighbors' properties. I did that when I first started doing real estate and architectural photography, I wanted to understand symmetry and I wanted to understand home design. And so I went to um, all of my neighbors' houses in my street, which were all beautiful properties. And I said to them, I'd love to just take one or two photo apps in your property just to see what lighting looks like in the morning, at midday and late afternoon and evening, just so I can get an understanding as to the fastest way for me to be able to not only capture these images, but to minimize the amount of editing processing that I need to do afterwards. So I would implore you to go and do that. Knock on your friends', friends uh, doors, knock on, um, on your neighbors' doors and ask if they will allow you to do so. You, you may get mixed reactions by some people, but at least you, you were trying to get out there. I want you to pick an area as well. If you live in Austin, Texas, uh, there's no need to go and shoot Missouri. There's no need to go and shoot Los Angeles. Don't go flying to places and all those kinds of things. Or don't go traveling any longer than an hour to get to a property. Um, stick to your local market. Because when you get to know your local market, well, first you can respond easily. Remember the real estate agents are going to ask you to be on demand um, and to be available often. So you need to be within a short traveling distance just to your area to be able to shoot those properties. Unless you're approached by a real estate agent that says, look, I have this really high end, high um, market property. It's an hour drive down the coast or wherever. Then of course you can take those on if you have the capability to do so. But I say stick to a local area because you get to know what types of properties are available to shoot in your area. Um, and you can start to, if you need to, go to social meetups, go to auctions, etc., and start to meet those people that are involved in the property industry and start to market yourself that way. I also want you to pick an agent. You can go knocking on doors and meeting with a whole bunch of agents and show your portfolio and, and all that kind of thing and offer all your services talk about the terms, etc. but pick one or two agents and that's it. Get to know those two men or women um, and how they operate as an agent and start to build a real relationship. Stay in touch with them and ask for work. There is no harm in asking for work. There's nothing embarrassing about that. You should never be embarrassed about going into, starting a business and going to clients or potential clients and saying, hey, 
I would love some work if you have some available. I'm here, this is what I can do. Here's my skills, here's my portfolio. Here's how I operate and here's my terms. And that way they'll start to understand that, okay, you are a legitimate business. You're not just uh, what we call a shoot and burn photographer that just wants to get a couple of shoots under their belt. Um, you're actually looking to build a legitimate business and that comes from building a relationship. Well, always remember what I said, never start for free. Always start with a price. Look in your local realty guide. This is one thing that I do all the time um, at what properties are on the market and what photographs actually going to make you say wow. Because you as a photographer would know what appeals to you. If you're in the real estate photography game already, then you'll know some way in what makes up a great photograph in real estate and particularly in architecture. So look through the realty guide and see what good photographs look like. You'll quite often find that a lot of real estate agents will say, think that they can do a better job than you. My argument is that real estate agents sell property, photographers photograph property. And I've always said that to real estate agents to say, you focus on your area, I'll focus on mine and I'll make you look good. And so when I say start in your local area as well, and you get to know your area, you'll get to know the types of properties in your area so you know how long shoots are going to take as well. If you're shooting a high-end property, you're probably gonna be there a good two hours. If you're shooting a low-end property that's a quick in and out, client doesn't have much time, or the, I should say the owner doesn't have much time to allow the agent to get the shoot done, you're gonna to need to think on your feet. So if you, again, starting in your local area, there's no need to travel big distances. Also want you to go to local auctions and understand what the buyers want in your area. You need to become like an agent in many regards because if you can understand the property market really, really well, then you're gonna be able to understand the types of um, the types of quality that are required for your photography to get to, for you to stand out and get more work from agents. Get to know types of agents in the area. We've already said that, but I want you to ask them a couple of questions. What do they specialize in? Do they specialize in prestige property or holiday homes? If they do, remember, you're gonna be there a lot longer photographing the property. Get to know many agents, but concentrate on just a few. And just remember that the first agent you speak with is never gonna give you the gig. Get to know many agents, but only focus on the two that you really get along with. Now, this means going to network meetings. This means knocking on doors, doing whatever you can to build a relationship with those real estate agents. And ask each one of those, if you build a relationship with two great agents either side of town, ask them to connect with each other and share their experiences about you and what your photography has done for their clients. Those two agents talking will then start to spread that news about you across town. I've seen this happen in numerous places. I've seen this happen in Sydney, Melbourne, Cairns, where I used to live in far north Queensland of Australia many, many times, which is absolutely flooded with photographers and very hard to stand out in the real estate market. I've seen that happen in numerous locations. So always be mindful that most of what you're gonna be doing as a real estate photographer is talking to people before you take any photographs. Ask what they want for their clients and what they wish they had in a photographer and then just do that. If they say, look, I need a photographer that's gonna be on time every single time, turn up five minutes early every single time. Turn up half an hour early if you need to and sit out the front and look over the property. See what the lighting's doing, the shadows of the gardens out the front. Have a look at all those different aspects as to what you can see. And after a while, once you've done a number of um, shoots, particularly in the same area, you get to know how the lighting is affected on properties within particular streets. And so you'll know if you need to go back to a street that you've shot before, you know what the lighting is going to do at 4 p.m. in winter. Um, you know what's going to do at 9 a.m. in summer. You'll be able to be able to almost predict what type of settings, what shoots you're going to be able to, uh, what images you're going to be able to produce from the shoot based off that knowledge. I want you to remember one thing: real estate photography is about the owner of the property. It has nothing to do with the agent, and it has nothing to do with you with you as the photographer, because your photography will actually sell the property, which will make the client happy. You're working for the real estate agent, the real estate agent working for the seller, 
but always remember that your images is what is going to help sell the property, not just the agent. So it's all about the owner of the property. Great images, fantastic. Great agent, fantastic. But if the owner doesn't attract any sellers through our work, working with the agent, they're gonna be unhappy right from the very start. So always remember that it's about the owner and you'll see that with what I'm about to talk about now. Why lighting isn't a, pri isn't a priority is probably one of the most contentious issues that I've always raised in my training. I teach a lot of people photography, particularly from an architectural stance, from a travel, tourism and marketing stance, and I've taught a lot of real estate agents how to take their own photographs when they feel as though they don't want to use the services of photographers such as us. So why lighting isn't a priority comes down to a couple of things. Learning to see. Before you do anything, stop. I always say this in workshops, wherever I go around the world, stop, put your bag down, put down your tripod, put the camera down and look around and see what can be photographed. You'd be quite amazed when you walk around a property for a good five to 10 minutes to see what is available to you to actually photograph. Then create a connection. Photograph from viewpoints that are natural to everyday living. So you know, sitting on the couch, etc. Minimize the distractions as well. You want to reduce as much clutter and frame out unnecessary items. But don't hide features. There's a difference between unnecessary items and features. Unnecessary items like you know, a large property with a big backyard that's full of tractor parts or old cars. You want to minimize seeing those kinds of things through the windows of the property if you're shooting from inside to out. Also minimize the amount of personal picture frames. This is one that I've come across a couple of times where the real estate agent has advised that the client has asked for nothing personal to be included in the images within the property, which is completely understandable. Um, now that means that bed frame, picture, uh, picture frames next to, next to bed, quite often I will ask if it's okay to put those in a drawer or to um, put them in a, a closet or somewhere out of view because quite often the seller of the property will not want to be identified and we all know how easy it is to zoom in on images wherever they are now, whether they're on the net, etc. And, um, and privacy has become quite an issue. So just remember that one. Um, tidy up, connect with the owner and ask permission to adjust the scene to suit the property type. Um, let's go into that a little bit more in detail actually. Let's start with learning to see and creating a connection. So when I say stop and look around, there are many, many features that you're gonna see in a property. There are probably some features that are gonna stand out a whole lot more than others, and they're probably gonna be the main selling points. I would confer with the real estate agent, say, look, what are the main selling points that you see in the property? Let's feature those in the foreground of some of these images so that the potential buyers can immediately see an attraction to wanting to come and view the property. Always look for clutter and particular viewpoints and ways to showcase the property. So when I talk about viewpoints and showcasing the property from that perspective, things like sitting down on the lounge. Quite often uh, uh, when you're in the real estate photography game, you'll walk in, you've got your camera on your tripod, you're set up in the middle of the room and you'll start to take photographs. That is a big red X to me. Don't do that whatsoever walk around the area, walk around the room, walk around the house, the apartment, what, whatever type of property it is, and do what people do in those houses, to a degree. <laughs> let, me, let me just pull back on that one a bit. Um, sit down on the lounge or kneel next to the bed, stand you know, at the shower door, um, sit on the balcony, do all those kind of things that people that would potentially live in that property would do, so that you can photograph from those perspectives. There's no point standing at the end of the dining table um, and looking into the kitchen. Sit at the dining table and if you have to, photograph it with something that has something attractive on the dining table that leads you through or across to the kitchen. Gives you a natural perspective as to how humans live in our properties. So that is really gonna change one way of selling yourself to the real estate agent because you're gonna give a human perspective. Now imagine that you are the selling agent and the house is yours. How would you like it depicted? Now you remember the previous image that I photographed of this same kitchen. This was my house from a number of years ago. 
and you can see that I've completely changed perspective and removed the dining, dining room from the picture and instead um, focused on showing the entry point into the house leading down to the kitchen. One thing I've also, also done in this image is to minimize not only the, the amount of distractions, but I've also included plant life, greenery and as much plant life as possible will really, really add to the appeal of a property. If you don't have those kind of things available to you in the property, then try to minimize the amount of hard structure in the shot. If there are you know, nice rugs or nice cushions on a lounge, um, nice soft padded bar stools at the kitchen bench, include those in the images. Turn on all the lights like I have in this image. And what I've done is I've dialed down my flash to bounce off the ceiling only, so I'm only getting minimal light bouncing off the ceiling. You can see that we can quite easily see where the down lights are and the top right hand corner is lighting the, um, the picture just above the fish tank. You can also see that the lighting is directly above the fridge and provides ample lighting there and that the four pendant lights above the kitchen bench glow off the ceiling and it gives almost like a, an entertaining type feel to the kitchen. Those are the kinds of appealing type images that agents love. And so do quite frankly, a lot of buyers go looking for that. How am I going to use this property to my advantage? Am I going to be able to entertain in this property? How comfortable and homely is this property going to be for me if I'm potentially going to buy it? And that's the kind of things you want to do with, this, with these kinds of uh, photographs is build, not only, not only include main features, but showcase how the lighting of the property itself in a natural stance and how it's been built. Here's another example as well. Again, this is a very brightly lit room, naturally brightly lit, but still turned on the lamps so that you can see the hanging pendant lights um, have some sort of appeal. You can see where the staircase on the left-hand side is leading up to the upper floor. When it comes to a complex type room uh, like this, it can be to your advantage to use what we call linear balance and separation in composition. Now you can notice, if you look at this image carefully, there are several things going on. One, you can see that the dining table and the bench seat on the right hand side are linear. So that means they're drawing your eye into the shop, the edges of the table, drawing you in to see what's in the room. The left hand side, we can see that we have a staircase leading up to that area, like I mentioned. In the background, I've opened the curtain slightly to show that there's a balcony out there. Um, on the right hand side, I've made sure that I've framed the dining table so that it is not only square in the center, but on the right hand side, you can see a little day, the day bed area, a little sitting area. I've included some decor on the table as well. It's inviting, it's a kitchen dining table. So I include some, some type of um, um, you know, fruit or something inviting like a wine glass, etc. All of those kind of ideas are quite often employed in serious advertising and marketing photography. And I'm, it stumps me why it's not used in real estate photography all the time. I, I quite often would see a room like this photographed where um, the, there's nothing on the dining table, the curtain is closed, um, all the lights are turned off, and it just looks like a dull, dark room. Um, one other thing you'll notice that in the background, you'll notice that there's looks as though there's an apartment building across the road. I have set my settings so that I've overexposed the background slightly and used as much flash as possible indoors so that you can see that there is a view outside from the balcony, but I don't want you to focus on the fact that it's a seven story apartment building across the road. Little aspects like that will give a hint as to I can sit outside, but I don't really need to focus on the fact that I'm probably surrounded by towers and towers of apartment buildings. So using those kinds of ideas in a complex room can really simplify what is actually seen. I like to shoot so that my images look as though um, it's come from a house and garden type magazine. I like to take a real advertising stance on my photography. And that talks to distractions and mess as well. Minimize the scene. Always talk to the agent or the owner about removing any unnecessary items. Things like washing and ironing boards, dirty dishes in the sink. 
I always um, set the expectation with real estate agents to say, look, if it's possible, can we move these things? I can minimise what I can in photography as much as possible, but if I need to photograph a kitchen and it's a mess, then we need to get the owner to do a bit of a cleanup. And so the agents that I work with, um, they know what my expectations are. They know what to what to do straight away every time. Um, again, talking about minimising the scene and tidying up. Now, I'm not suggesting that you actually do a clean of the house. That's not your job. Um, but with permission, it probably pays to your advantage to ask if it's okay to adjust things like cushions on the lounges or straighten the bed linen. Um, now this may sound really OCD, but it really goes to how much attention to detail your images will reflect. If you open the blinds and the curtains, you're gonna na let in that more natural light, but just never assume that this is gonna be done for you by the agent. So always premise that before you step into the property, make sure that the owner is okay with it. If they're on site, make sure the real estate agent is okay with it. That you start straightening things up, if you need to adjust a table, like the dining table is not quite linear, I'm, I'm very much for symmetry. Um, and you'll notice that as you get better at your photography, the more symmetry that you include in your real estate and your architecture photography, you will notice that um, you'll take on more of a professional look in your images. Symmetry is a massive thing in architecture photography, so always keep that in mind. And if you're straightening things up, straightening the bed, straightening the linen, um, you know, opening the blinds and the curtains, all that is going to add to that attention, attention, attention to detail that you're going to bring to your images. When it comes to image and data loss, this is something that hurts so many people in the photography industry because no one follows the rules. And when I talk about rules, there are actually a number of rules. Dual cards, I've mentioned that before. If you can pick a camera that has dual card slots, do it every time just in case because you never know when you're going to lose a card and there will be some time during your career that you will get organized build yourself a damn process if you don't know what a damn process is well, i'm going to show you that in the next slide practice it know it and use it it's essentially digital asset management if you don't know what that is google it use dropbox i use online tools such as dropbox to back up all my files um, anything that needs to go to a client um, or anything that needs to go to colleagues in the industry. I use Dropbox, um, I use um, a whole bunch of online tools that allow me to archive my files, even the edits and even the final file. Um, and, you, and, and then I've, I've got something that's available to me basically on my phone that I can access Dropbox and I can use for marketing. If you do a great shoot and the images are absolutely on point with a real estate agent and with the owner, there's no reason why you can't use those in your own marketing. That should be set in your terms and conditions of how you supply your images to your clients that you can still use your own images in marketing. Now, there's contentious issues around the world around um, copyright. In Australia, when you take a photograph, you automatically own copyright of that image unless there's a person depicted in it, such as a portrait or a wedding. Um, but when it comes to real estate photography, it's not an issue. I believe in the United States, uh, you guys sometimes have to uh, register your images so that copyright is registered, so that you can avoid things like um, lawsuits that might involve um, punitive or compensatory damages, etc. all those kinds of things. So protect yourself in that regard, not just with data loss, but also how you store and market your images as well. Be mindful of your files, how to save a bad day is, uh, you know, you've got to remember first thing, you're in business. So if you don't have any files, you don't have any images, then you're not in business because you've got nothing to supply to clients. Now just always remember, use one SD card per shoot or one, one set of SD cards per shoot. That is, if you're using a single card or a dual card camera and you go to four shoots during the day, then you're gonna need either four or eight cards. And that is using one set of cards per shoot. That's a golden rule. I've come across that numerous times myself where I have stupidly made mistakes where I've thought, I'll be okay, I'll use the same card for the next shoot. And all of a sudden I've gone to preview the previous shoot's images and I get the dreaded message of image file cannot be 
profound or card is corrupt or one of those kind of messages and your heart just falls out of your throat when that happens. So always remember to have numerous cards in a card wallet um, and have them available to you as you go, particularly if you're doing multiple shoots per day. Use cloud again to share those and archive those client files, like I said, Dropbox, etc. Get organized, back, ep, back up everything, do it twice. And if you need to, and you happen to have a really bad day in your photography business, then try Rescue Pro. It may help. That's a piece of software by Sandisk that can help you recover files off your cards. Um, it doesn't always work, but in, in my experience, it's worked most of the time. So keep that as a little tip. Damn workflow, digital asset management. If you're going to be supplying high-end files or any type of files to your real estate agent and they want them fast, you need to get used to working in a fast workflow. First thing, number one, as soon as you get back to your office, your home, wherever you work from, if you haven't used the Western Digital device that I mentioned earlier, where you can slide your SD card straight into a hard drive, do an automatic backup, then get those images off those cards and straight onto two hard drives as fast as possible. And then double check on both hard drives that all files are there and that they all check out. I utilize a NAS system, so a network attached storage system. It's a basically a box with multiple hard drives in it that can each back up each other's, um, each, each hard drive has a backup of each other. So I use a Drobo and it has five storage disks in it. Um, three, of which, three of which are for storage, two are for backup. So that means that I can archive all my images from the two spare mobile hard drives that I take around onto my Drobo, and I know that I've always got a full client archive system available to me. From there, then I'll go into my main computer and I'll create folders. And now this folder will be related to the date of the shoot, the actual client's name, and partially the address. So as an example, if you're shooting on the 1st of January 2017, your date should be 2017-0101 underscore the client's name being the real estate agent's name or the agency underscore part of the address like 42 Winchester or something along those lines. And then from there, you use that folder to put the images into and that's what you import into your edit program. Never import direct from the card. I always say that even though you've made your backups, never import from the card because the card trying to read, uh, the software trying to read directly from a card can cause corruption issues. Um, and that's just going to slow you down in your process. So always remember that backup first, create your folders, name them to suit the client, and then import your images into the editing program based on the folder that you've just created. Moving to architectural photography, this is a different realm, and I touched on this at the beginning of this webinar, that awards, uh, research, getting new gear, and practicing are gonna be your four keys. Now, you've noticed I've said nothing about taking photographs. What I want you to do is attend photo industry events to view what winning entries into judging competitions, etc., look like, and find out why they've won awards. I want you to research architectural and high-end housing magazines and actually look up home builders. Home builders are completely different to home sellers. Home builders will bring in advertising and marketing gurus, um, quite often art directors and producers to have the home photographed to such a degree that it looks absolutely irresistible to buy or to build with them. I want you to consider looking at new gear as well. You may need to invest in a couple of new lenses. Consider a couple of multiple lighting sources, like I said, multiple flash heads that you can remotely trigger. Um, consider looking at that as well. And practice. Spell the word practice, write it down, put it on your fridge, do whatever you can, but remember to practice as much as possible. So let's get a little bit more serious about architecture. I want to go into this because it's going to show you the difference between real estate photography and actually doing architecture work for people like architects and for home builders and for um, building um, designers, et cetera. Attend seminars. You need to learn from professionals. You need to attend workshops. There is no harm in going out there and learning 
how to expand your photography. I still attend workshops on landscape photography. I still attend workshops on commercial photography. I still watch seminars and webinars such as this, learning from people about how to best improve my photography. And every time I still learn something. I want you to watch award judging. Most of the judging that is done for international awards competitions in photography um, are, are usually streamed online nowadays. So remember there's the Australian Institute of Professional Photography Awards, the APAs, they're on every year. There's also the Professional Photographers of America, the International Photography Competition that's on every year as well. The Australian one is generally around about September every year. The International Photography Competition in America, I think is around about June, July every year. New Zealand's is usually in June as well. Uh, attend those things and have a look. It doesn't cost you anything to attend and watch and, and stream for free to watch the judging. Um, I want you to visit weird buildings too. If you live in a big city, go and find some strange buildings. There will be in some way, in your, your city or in your area, there will be some crazy looking buildings. There will be some old historic architecture. Go and look for those kind of things. Photograph them. Look for shapes and abstracts and ways of seeing things. Look for reflections and symmetry. I'm, like I said, I'm big on symmetry and, and I'm gonna show you some images in a second as to, as to how that plays out. You're gonna see images that are completely different from what real estate photography looks like. Invest in better lenses. Prime lenses or tilt shift lenses, if you've never heard of those, they're actually gonna elevate your images and save you a ton of editing time. This one I'm talking about, these are tilt shift lenses. You'll notice these two from Nikon and Canon, and you'll see the base at the bottom of the image where the, uh, the lenses mount to the camera are fixed, but the top of the lens can actually tilt or sway either way, and that will help you to correct the perspective of your images. When you quite often look at a photograph or look at a building um, you know, from down the bottom, on the bottom floor, ground floor, and you're looking up a building, you tend to get that, that fall in, that convergence of the building falling in on itself. Architects go mad when they see that kind of thing because it feels as though their building has been depicted as falling over. So when you use a tilt shift lens, you can point towards the base of the building and tilt the shift, the, um, the lens upwards up the building and it will correct the perspective of the shot. It makes a massive, massive difference. The other thing that tilt shift lenses do is that miniature look. This was a shoot that I did for the Gold Coast City Council in America. You guys have counties, we have councils and this was taken, it, you, you're probably noticing, well where's the architecture in this shot? The architecture is actually within the light rail or the tram design. So how the tram interacts with the surrounding streets, etc. Be mindful, that's still a form of architecture. How that tram sits on the tracks, how it interacts with the community and the traffic and the actual design of the platforms, etc. It's all still part of architecture. And a tilt shift lens can help to focus on that exact point through the middle of the shot and to minimize the amount of buildings in the background. You can see there's a lot of tall high rises. I didn't want those in focus in any way, shape or form. So we used the tilt shift methodology to focus on what the client was asking for. Remember to practice, practice, practice. If you're not saying that word, I want you to say it now. Practice, practice, practice. Go out there and practice as much as possible. And remember that real estate photography is not architecture photography. When you're talking about architecture, you're talking about commercial photography. These are images that are not just going to be used to sell a property, but are actually going to be used to win the building designer or the architect an award, or it's going to be used in some type of multi, sometimes multi-million dollar marketing campaigns. So remember that moving to high-end architectural photography means moving to a high-end attitude and practices. Yes, you can charge a lot more, sometimes upwards of five, ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars, depending on what the project is and what the budget is. But you've got to learn what architectural design is. Remember to read architectural magazines, look at their websites, and see the difference. 360 VR walkthroughs, in my mind, are not being done as much nowadays because a lot of video has taken over for walkthroughs. Real estate photography, it tends to cross over with architecture when you take up 360 degree VR walkthroughs, 
But like I said, not so much being done these days. Um, I don't tend to use it at all in any way, shape or form. And I haven't come across many real estate agents recently that still like walkthroughs. They've moved more to video. When it comes to colour, uh, those, uh, those of you that know me um, will know that even though I love tourism and travel photography as well as architecture photography, when it comes to architecture, I simplify, simplify, simplify. I want to remove as much distraction as possible and quite often that means colour. This is an image that I took in the United States in, in the interior of a building and to me the colours on the left hand side looking down all the balcony frames serve no purpose. They're not bright in colour so that stone look blue etc doesn't really add to the image. So I formed in my own mind that I wanted to convert this immediately to a black and white image and straight away I get massive amounts of shape, form, line and texture in that image and I still have life being that man walking across the balcony that adds to the image. It simplifies it, it removes the distraction of the colour and you'd be surprised um, that how much colour can distract in your images. Now this is not going to be relevant to real estate photography when it comes to colour because people want to see colour of course but when it comes to architecture quite often architects are going to want to see something like this so remember to convert to black and white whenever, wherever and whenever you need to. Here's another example that utilises shape and form this is in my home city of Sydney um, looking straight up the face of a building and I just love the interweaved web and the reflection of the clouds above in all the glass windows. So it creates texture, shape and form all in one image and gives me a type of abstract type look to my symmetry. This is another example as well. Many, many architects are gonna to wanna to see um, not just the whole building, but they're gonna to wanna to see elements of their design, the detailed design. So use lines to create interest as much as possible. This looks a little bit pixelated on the, on the screen. Um, this is a little bit of a crop in of a wider image, but I wanted to use this image to detail something like an overhang, which is framing um, ceiling to floor glass right throughout the entire building on every floor, really simplifies how that architect has designed that building. Always remember that architecture doesn't have to be indoors either. One of my favourite buildings in the world is outdoors and sits in a lot of fog and a lot of rain in San Francisco. The Golden Gate Bridge is probably one of the most magnificent um, marvels of um, architecture, photography, architecture that there is. So remember to try photographing things like this as well and incorporate how it interacts into the community as well and, and into the environment. You can see that the top of the bridge there is blending straight into that fantastic San Francisco fog. Again, it's about patterns and lines. This is another example. Bright colour I've used here to emphasise that the space is so open, so vibrant. Um, I've included no life in this shot, but I've included a lot of lighting. So I've focused on the four poles leading me through the shot as my main area and the amount of lighting in the place has a lot of form and shadow and texture um, building into the shot. You can see the bottom left hand corner, I've got you know, a little bit of a rhomboid, I've got a, a triangle shape. On the right hand side, I've got texture between the upper, upper wall and the lower wall with the grid showing through. All those kind of things add to the architectural appeal of what their client who's designed that building wants to see. Another one is use light and shadow. You may be asking yourself, is this a staircase? No, it's not. It's the shadows from the poles on the left-hand side and the light shining in through the window. So when you first look at it, um, it looks as though it's a play on light and shadow and a staircase. Um, I love this shot because of the simplicity of it. Um, it almost looks as though it's leading you up uh, a staircase to the little uh, yellow cushion seating area in the background. So remember to use light and shadow as much as possible. Also, one thing that I will leave you with is stylizing your images by including human life in them. If you get to a point where you're converting across to architecture photography, particularly if you're doing hotels, there is nothing worse in my mind, and particularly in a lot of art directors' minds that I've worked with, who see a hotel room that is completely empty, particularly um, foyers or 
um, even conference rooms in hotels, um, Airbnb properties such as this should show life, um, should show you know, the features of the property, the design of the property. This particular image shows the owner of this Airbnb property and I asked her to walk um, through the property and I slowed my shutter speed down so that she was one, not identified, and two, it showed movement and life in the property. So always remember to include those kind of aspects when it comes to architecture as well. There's no harm in doing that in real estate photography as well. Ask if the owners want to be in the shots, showing life in the property. You're not gonna get a great deal of people that are willing to do that, but if you do, you're gonna see a massive lift in how those images are marketed to the marketplace. So really, really quickly, I want to go over just why I think Aurora HDR is perfect for this type of photography. There are a number of things that I think are absolutely crucial to why you should be using it. And the first thing is the Quantum HDR AI engine. This is your artificial intelligence engine. It was the most amazing piece of um, um, software creation that I've come across for a long time. Um, the lack of noise in the extreme dynamic detail that, you, that this software will draw out of your images is amazing, absolutely amazing. It has options galore, like smart structure, where you get precision, but you won't get much in the way of artifacts, those will be withdrawn. Advanced tools like layering, layers and masking, which you get in programs that we all know cost thousands of dollars or you know, um, dozens of dollars to, to access every month. Batch processing, you get hundreds of bracketing images that are available to be batch processed. And this, this type of software, Aurora HDR, will do that with ease. It's non-destructive, raw support for most cameras, or I'd say nearly all cameras. Um, and it has an unlimited history to reverse all your edits. Those are the kinds of things that are really gonna speed up your workflow. And so with that, now I'd like to, maybe hand over to Abba because I know he wants to do a little bit of a demo on um, some, of the, some of the features that Aurora HDR can bring to your real estate and your architecture workflow, your editing processes, and just some of the, the fantastic ways that your images can look and it can be edited and can just blow the minds of your clients with this fantastic software. So if you want to stay in touch, um, my details are there on the screen as well as the guys from Skylum. You can go to their website, skylum.com slash Aurora HDR to check out the software. You can go to my website. I've got my, my main website there where you can check out everything that I do. I've got my workshops website there, Capture the Planet Workshops is what I run. Um, we've got photographybookseries.com. There's a typo in that. My apologies. That should be photographybookseries.com where I've got eight books that I've published on photography and also One Shot Magazine, which you can get for free. If you want to follow me on Instagram, you'll find me at those details right there. So with that, uh, all that said, Abba, I know we've gone over a little bit over time, but uh, I'd love to be able to hand back to yourself and um, let's do a little bit of a, a demo on Aurora HDR, yeah? Well, thank you so much, Steve. That was literally a master class on real estate and architecture <laughs> photography in an hour. I mean, I, I learned so much and there was just so much information and I thank you for doing the business side as well as the artistic side because I think a lot of photographers forget about the business side and, and that's why they're not successful. They're not financially successful. So that was just, uh, I'm blown away. That was an outstanding presentation. And with that, I'm going to show a little bit of a roar um, just to highlight some of the things that Steve talked about. We'll go through it pretty quickly. And then if folks want to ask some questions, uh, go ahead and type that into the chat box and I'll ask those questions to Steve. But let me quickly switch over to uh, myself as the presenter. So I need to change the presenter here. And I believe I am now the presenter. We should be seeing um, that main screen. I'm going to share my screen. Let's see if that shows up. Oh, yeah, I'm looking at the wrong screen to share my screen. There we go. Show my screen. There we go. So you should be seeing I have some images on here. As a matter of fact, uh, I have some of the raw images that Steve uh, lent us to work with. And I just want to show you that you have a couple of options when working with Aurora HDR. You can use a single image and expand the dynamic range. And as Steve pointed out, 
the beautiful thing about Aurora HDR is it really recovers your highlights and opens up your shadows without getting a lot of noise. And you can bring in that detail. And you can also, if you decide to shoot bracketed images, you can see over here on the left window that I have open. These were shot where some of the images were underexposed and some were slightly overexposed. So you can compensate for the high and the, the highlights and the shadows you know, looking out the window and within the foreground. So we'll just explore this very quickly. Uh, as you can see, some of these images, as a matter of fact, I'm going to grab this one, which was a really nice image that Steve used. Uh, and this was the camera raw. And I can see he shot camera raw. And that's one of the things that's important because when you shoot raw, you get a much wider dynamic range than you would if you had tried to shoot uh, with a JPEG. The information is just not there. So I dropped that image onto Aurora. And it's going to ask me a couple of questions with a single image. And it's with this drop down. So I can choose, if I wanted to, to apply some color to noise as it does that initial processing. And this is really useful when you have darker areas or a low light where you didn't have the opportunity to properly expose the image. So you can have that on by default. And also, if you're using some wide angle lenses, especially if you're just starting out and some of the lesser expensive wide angle lenses, you'll see chromatic aberration or that fringing on the outer rings of the lens. And sometimes you'll want to click on that option here for Aurora to compensate for that and fix that while it's doing the initial processing. You can also apply denoise as well as fix some of that fringing once you've opened it up. So when I click this, what Aurora is going to do when I click Create HDR, it's going to analyze the image, look at the contents of the image, find the, the brightest and the darkest area, and adjust the tonality. And this is where the quantum AI engine comes into play. It is analyzing everything. And you'll notice just out of the box when I process this that you'll see so much more detail out the window and in the highlights as well as in the shadows. So this is the processed image just opening it up in Aurora, I want to show you what the before looked like. So this was the original shot. It, the sensor has captured a lot of information, but when it's in the raw format, it's not necessarily brought forth when you open up the image. And that's where Aurora really comes into play. And you can see the nuance here that Steve got when he shot this, when he exposed this, that you can see this detail in the foreground and the balance here and this really beautiful light. And I loved uh, your comment, Steve, about understanding when is the best time of the day to shoot an image. Because you don't just walk in if you have the luxury and just go snap, snap, snap. You look at the potential of what's happening with the light. And I think you've really captured that here. So you can see with just bringing it into Aurora, you've already you know, recovered a lot of the highlights and opened up the shadows, but you still have a lot more control. So I could open up the HDR basic. And if I needed to compensate, I could control the exposure. I could increase the contrast a little bit to make it pop. If I needed to recover the highlights, I could. So it's really nice just out of the box, but I could tweak it. And depending on how you're shooting your image, you know, you can add a little bit of detail. We have something called HDR smart structure. And you know, I like Steve's philosophy that you want to keep things natural. So you don't want to over process your image. And that's where HDR smart structure comes into play. It's It looks at the areas that should be sharpened, that you should have more structure, but it doesn't add them to the areas such as the wall and whatnot. And again, with all of these, I think a little bit goes a long way, especially when you're dealing with real estate, because you do want it to look natural. You don't want that crazy HDR look. So this is really nice. and. One of the other things that came to mind when Steve was talking about, you know, picking the time of day is getting that golden hour to get things to be a little bit warmer. You can see the light temperature here is a little bit warmer and you can control the color temperature after you shoot with a couple of the other filters. I could use the glow filter here, just opening it up a little bit and you're not really seeing a glow, but then I can warm it up just the hair. And let me just bring that up a little bit. And with this turned on and turned off, it just very subtly warms up the image. So you could use the glow, you could also use image radiance to do the same thing, bring it up a little bit, and then warm up the image to give you more of that golden hour. And again, following his philosophy, which I think is great, is don't oversaturate. You know, it's it should look natural. And a lot of times people oversaturate the colors and it actually detracts from the image. So this is the before. And this is the after without a lot of work. And the nice thing is I can batch process 
hundreds of images by simply dropping them onto the Aurora application. So I need to turn things around quickly. I drop those images on. I can create a preset for how I like to process the image and just very quickly you know, bring out the, uh, the details, do a hair of enhancement, maybe add a little bit of a golden hour to it and let the application do the work instead of me having to do it uh, shot by shot. Another thing that's really nice is the fact that I have layers. So if I wanted to, I could process this image the way it is and then add another layer with a new adjustment layer and I have another full set of these filters. And if I wanted to say add more detail to maybe the couch or to something that's specific, I could add details to just the entire image here, what appears to be the entire image, but then use my masking tool with a brush and paint those details in only in the areas that I want. So I could zoom in, I could, I'm simply going to hit control one or command one, and that will zoom me into 100% move my space bar. This is definitely too much, but take a look at what I could do. I could just paint those details into the lamp. And you notice that the rest of the image is the way it should be. And then if I wanted to, I could dial that back down a little bit. So the nice thing is that with any one of these images, if you need to compensate for something, if the window is a little bit too bright, too distracting, you could paint that in with a mask and lower the exposure. Or conversely, as Steve indicated, you know, you don't want to see that apartment building out the door, maybe you want to artificially blow it out a little bit. So you have a lot of control with your layers. And that's one of the nice features. Now I'm going to go ahead and close this and I'm not going to save it because I also want to show you how you can work with bracketed images. And we have both exteriors and interiors. I'll grab these three images here. And all I'm going to do is drop those onto Aurora once again. And it will launch Aurora, and I can see the exposure value of each of these images. And I can take advantage of the fact that the underexposed one's showing me a lot more detail out the window, and the overexposed one is showing me a lot more detail inside. So when you do multiple images, you will be given the option for auto alignment. And this is great because a lot of times, even when you're on a tripod, sometimes cameras get bumped. If it's outside, there's wind. If you're hand holding them, which a lot of times you're doing because it is very run and gun, you know, click on auto alignment and Aurora will align these four images so everything lines up. If we go to that drop down cog that we saw earlier, you'll see a couple of other options here. Because we have multiple images, there is an option for ghost reduction. So if there's now movement within the frame, birds flying, uh, perhaps people moving, you see there's some people in the very deep distance of this shot, uh, trees blowing, you may want to remove some of that ghosting when you blend those images. So you can choose which is your reference images that you want to use. And by default, um, you it'll show the middle range, but you can pick any one of the images, and then you can show how aggressive you want it to be to remove that ghosting. Again, there's your color to noise and your chromatic aberration, which we saw earlier. And the big thing to keep in mind here is if you don't need to check it, don't, because every box you check requires a little more processing time. And a lot of times we're not that patient to wait. But if you really want perfection, you can turn on these. It'll just take a little bit longer to process. I'm not going to worry about color to noise now, but I do want to worry about ghost reduction. And then when I hit create HDR, it's going to analyze each of those images individually and get the best tonality from each image. And then we'll look at them in contrast to each other and automatically create masks and use the best part of each image to give you an image with the most dynamic range possible. So you can look at these words coming across. It was loading the image. It tries to detect the scene type. If you're an outdoor image with mountains and sky or indoor, with architecture. So we've used machine learning to analyze tens of thousands of images that uh, the raw images, as well as the images that have been hand processed by photographers. And the machine learns what the photographer does. And we in turn can do that automatically using Aurora HDR. So now it's tweaking, it's making it awesome. It's gonna combine these four images. And I want you to see what the, one of the original middle range images looked like. I'm going to do the quick preview. So this is what was shot. And there wasn't a lot of dynamic range here, but you can see we've already picked up detail out the window, yet we can see what's happening inside. And once we've done this, we can then use all those same tools to tweak it. So if I needed to uh, recover my highlights a little more to see the outside, maybe to see those 
clouds. And one of the nice things that we have here is this one called smart toning, this slider. And if I move it to the left, it will recover my highlights, but not affect my shadows. And if I move it to the right, it'll open up my shadows, but not affect my highlights. So this is great. I can recover a little bit of the detail in the sky. If I wanted to, I can add a polarizing filter, which will make that blue sky stand out a little bit more, and then perhaps go back to my basic and even open up my shadows. So very quickly, I can take an image that would have been really hard to capture, and I can see exactly what's happening. And I really liked uh, Steve's comment on, you know, sometimes architecture is great in black and white. So I'm really curious. I hadn't thought about it for this image, but I can either apply a black and white LUT to this image, so you can see I can hover over a variety of stylistic looks. And I believe I do have a black and white there. Gives me a different look. The other option is I could remove the saturation from this image and see if my eye is drawn more to the architecture. So this is another nice feature. And finally, what I wanna do, I'm gonna close this out. And I just want you to see if I have a folder of images that either can be bracketed or not. So I have this folder of images right here. It's named it right after our webinar, Getting Started in Real Estate Photography. And I'm going to drop that whole folder on top of my Aurora icon. Let's see if I can do that. I think I might need to launch it. Let me launch that here. Uh, batch processing. Uh, that's where I needed to drop it on. Switch back to my finder. And let's look into the desktop local. There it is. All of my images from that folder getting started in real estate photography, I drop that on. It will automatically find the images that are grouped by their bracketing using the time of day as well as the shot numbers. And I can see it's grouped these. If I wanted to, I could remove any of these if it brought in an extra one. And then I could process them as brackets with an automatically and just kick them out and I'm already done. So that's just an idea. We have several webinars where we actually go into a lot more detail. And the point of this one was really that education, learning how to think like a real estate or an architecture uh, photographer. And I think Steve did an amazing job, lots of lessons learned. Uh, I do wanna point out because we are running over though I am gonna throw it back to some questions. I have some questions is that uh, there's a promo code if you wanna get Aurora for $10 off, you can use Steve's uh, promo code, it's simply S-R-E, and you use that code when you purchase it and it will automatically knock $10 off the price of Aurora on the Skylum website. And with that, Steve, I'm gonna ask you a couple of questions and let me just actually switch back to your last slide so people can see exactly what uh, all the ways they can reach you. So let me go ahead and see if I can hand that back to you. The first question that we have is in reference to drone photography. And do you ever use drones when you're shooting? No, I don't. Um, there are a number of uh, guys that I know of in the industry that have had to go through some very painstaking processes in getting licenses. Um, particularly in Australia, we have the Civil Aviation Safety Authority. And they're the governing body that uh, looks after all aircraft traffic in Australia and throughout the country, throughout Australia. And it can make it a very, very expensive process to want to do so. So a lot of people that have gone ahead and purchased drones have found that they're not getting the return based on one, their willingness to go out and you know, do exactly what we talked about in this webinar, and that is go out and meet the agents and talk to people and build relationships to actually build a business. They think that you get one or two shoots and put a drone up in the air and I risk not getting caught or not having my license revoked will get me more work. And I, I know a, a number of photographers, particularly here on the Gold Coast, on the East Coast of Australia, that have received quite large fines in excess of several thousands of dollars for putting drones in the air. And my personal pers perspective is that um, whilst it gives a great um, you know, perspective as to the location of a property, et cetera, I'm finding that video is taking over more and more because it's walking people through the property and quite often a site map or um, an aerial plan. I mean, you can look at a, where a property is located in Google now, uh, you know, planet, uh, um, Google Earth, et cetera or on maps, et cetera, you can, you can see where the property is located. So 
I'm seeing the need for the use of drones to be dropping away and really only enthusiasts that want to get some of those great aerial shots along coastlines and, and all that kind of thing are starting to use drones more and more. Um, I'm starting to see video taking over more than anything, to be honest. Excellent. That, that's really good advice. I think, you know, bringing the law into it and understanding that licenses are required, uh, it, it's more than just, you know, buying a, a drone and taking pictures. So that's uh, good advice. Absolutely. Another question was, um, if you want to practice architecture photography, do you need to ask permission to photograph the building first? It depends on what type of building it is. Um, if it's what we consider to be a, an open public space, um, then generally you won't necessarily need permission, but there are certain limitations on certain spaces. And a great example is in Sydney and Australia, the foreshore around Sydney Harbour and the iconic um, uh, Sydney Opera House, which is the black and white image that you have on your webinar registration page on the Skyland website that I took a number of years ago that was taken from a distance because I love the architecture of the sails, et cetera. But actually getting onto the foreshore and photographing that building can be quite a nightmare. If you don't ask for permission from, in this case, the Sydney Foreshore Harbour Authority, um, they can quite often ask you to leave the premises. And how do you define where the premises is if that building is in a public space? And so I have always erred on the side of caution and approached the building. The foyer, usually the security in the bottom of the, uh, in the foyer and the base of the building, and asked what restrictions there are on taking photographs. Now there'll be two premises that will usually come up. One, that the owner doesn't want any photographs taken, or two, that there's a fee required to access that property, to take photographs if you're gonna use them in a commercial sense. Now, that always brings up the argument, well, what if I'm a tourist just taking a photograph of the building? What makes me any different from somebody that's going to be taking a photograph professionally? And that argument is one that needs to be had on site with the owner or with the security at the time. And you know, I'll, I'll reverse on the word argument. Let's try and have a discussion around it <laughs> rather than an argument and work out the best way to go forward with that. You will find restrictions on those kinds of things. Many public buildings, from a distance, not an issue. But when it comes to actually being on the premises that the building is located on, I always tend to ask permission. That's great advice. Uh, I, I think I want to wrap this up. Uh, we've had an amazing uh, amount of information presented. A couple of things that stood out to me from your presentation that just I think are incredibly valuable and show just your years of business acumen is you know, first of all, never work for free. I think that was incredibly valuable because once you work for free, people think you'll always be free or when they're ready to spend some money, they're going to go to the guy. Well, you're the free guy. They're going to go to the, the guy who actually has been charging. So that that's a great start off. And, you know, the when doing real estate, two things really popped out when you said think like an agent, which is a very unique way of looking at things is that you're not thinking just like a photographer. You're thinking, okay, what are you selling? What is the objective here? What is the best way to show off the property? Uh, I thought that was uh, really helpful. And then the attention to detail. Sometimes people are like, you have to go in. And what I've learned from you that the high end shoot was two hours, which means the quick shoots are really fast, yet you still have to put down your camera, take a breath, pay attention to the detail, what you're trying to do in the light. You know, there's just so many nuggets in this presentation, and I really appreciate the time you put in to prepare for this and to give us some of your lessons learned. Uh, and we'll have this um, this webinar. It's been recorded. So if you've missed something or you want to watch it again or just look at the notes on the slides, uh, we will be reposting this. But you know, I have five pages of notes of just listening to you, things I wanted to talk about. Oh, it wow. just it just shows you how rich your presentation was. So I want to thank right. you very thank much, you. Steve, not only for helping uh, educate us and both the style of photography and also the business, but getting up early because it's tomorrow morning in Australia on the Gold Coast right now. And I appreciate you <laughs> your time this early, probably before you've had your 17th cup of coffee. And it was just a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful experience. So thank you so much for taking the time to, uh, to talk to us and talk about real estate and architecture, photography, and the business behind it.
Well, well, thank you very much, Abba, and to everyone there at the Skyland team. I'm, I'm just as grateful as well to be able to um, pass this information on to anybody out there that's considering getting into not just real estate photography and architecture photography, but ge in general business photography. Um, anything to do with marketing or advertising or commercial photography in any way, there are still some aspects of what I presented today that can be utilised in that in that realm. So uh, I'm very grateful um, and. I hope that everybody's been able to capture as many notes as other. And, um, and if you want to be in touch with me in any way, shape or form, then, you know, the guys at Skyline can put me in, uh, put you in touch with me, or you can go to my details that are on the screen right there. There's lots of free resources for you to learn from, um, as well as a whole bunch of workshops that, uh, that I hold throughout the world. So, um, thank you very much again. I appreciate the time and I appreciate the, uh, the offer to come and talk with your, your audience and spend the time. So thank you. Well, thank you, Steve, and thank everybody for joining us and for watching this. Hope you got a lot out of it, and enjoy the rest of your day or the rest of the evening, depending on where in the world you are.